Please welcome Stuart. Oh, thank you. You guys realize I, I pitched this, full disclosure, just so I could get my kilt out and prance it around. And then if you got the wig, right, why not have the wig? So anyway, thanks for indulging me, but I think I'm going to make it worth your while. So let's take, let me take you to 1944. A group of British commandos with uh, some Yugoslav resistance fighters are trying to reclaim an island named Brach from the Nazis. It's in the Adriatic opposite Italy. And a group of about 40 soldiers with a commander have been tasked to capture a hilltop position they call Point 662. Now, they're under heavy fire and they're fighting their way to the top. And when their leader gets to the peak, he looks around him and every single one of his soldiers is either dead or injured. Realizing that all is pretty much lost, he stands and waits for his fate. And sure enough, the, uh, the Germans lob a concussion grenade, knock him out, take him into uh, custody, take him as a prisoner of war. Now, when you take prisoners of war, right, the first thing you gotta do is get their weapons from them. And the exact exchange was lost to history, but some poor German soldier had to go to his commanding officer and explain that the guy who got to the top of the hill, who evaded every bullet and every grenade and every missile that was launched at him, did it armed with a bagpipe. <laughs> and that guy is this guy, Lieutenant Colonel John Malcolm Thorpe Fleming Churchill. If there's a more English name, I'd love to hear it. But how did this Englishman, probably of Norman descent, become such a Scotophile that he's gonna take a bagpipe into war when there are maybe more practical implements one could be carrying <laughs> upon one's person? So that story starts in uh, 1920. And um, he's part of a, a army regiment known as the Manchesters. And he's stationed in Burma. And there also happens to be a um, pipe band there. He becomes absolutely enamored with the instrument and starts studying under the band leader. And when his um, service during that time ends in the late 1920s, um, he goes back to, uh, back to Britain. And he decides he wants to study some more. So he's going to go up to Scotland. So. Um, now, his friend and biographer, the guy you see him with here, uh, the, the gentleman on the right, uh, named Rex King Clark, wrote that to, to Churchill, bagpipes were more than just about the music. Yeah. <laughs> it was about picking up the Scottish lasses. And I know what you're thinking, and I thought it too, but you guys, the electric guitar was at, at least 15 years away. So... <laughs> If you want to impress Scottish ladies, this is maybe your best bet. And it, I'm given to understand it worked, but that wasn't the only thing he picked up when he was in Scotland. Um, he also developed an abiding love for the uh, Scottish broadsword, particularly the thing you see on the bottom, which is known as the basket-hilted Scottish broadsword. Now, what he's holding in the picture is not Scot... Uh, forget it. You, can, you know where I'm coming from, right? So um, I just know some pedant is going to be out there like, that's not a basket hilted. <laughs> so he loved it so much that he would later go on to say that any officer who goes into battle without his sword is improperly dressed. Um, and he was undoubtedly properly dressed in 1941 when, uh, again, with a group of commandos, um, he was tasked with taking over a, um, an installation, a, a Nazi installation, off the coast of Norway that was for like shipping and fueling. It was a big depot. And they had to go to get control of it and destroy it. So the RAF comes in. Imagine they're, they're coming in. They're dropping smoke bombs because they want to obscure the landing vessels that have all the foot soldiers. So they successfully do that. But thank you. <laughs> but, but Churchill thinks, hey, you know, this is a great opportunity to hop up on the deck of the ship and start playing the freaking bagpipes as loud as he can. I'm not a military strategist, you guys, but I'm pretty sure that if your Air Force is out there trying to give you cover, the last thing you should be doing is playing the loudest instrument known to man, giving away your position. But he didn't give a shit, okay? And as they got close to the shore, he's the first guy off. And I don't know if you can see it. It's hard to see in the picture, so I'll zoom it in for you. That is Jack Churchill rushing into enemy territory, defended by machine guns and grenades, and he's carrying a sword. 
and he's not carrying a gun. <laughs> Remarkably, this raid was a success. They got control of the facilities, they rounded up all the German soldiers and took them as prisoners, and then the next task was blow the shit up, right? So, and this is where I've come to learn that I think he was kind of odd salon people, right? Because... <laughs> He figured, yeah, we got to blow this up, but I bet those German officers have some pretty good alcohol. So he goes into their quarters, and he apparently finds a very nice bottle of wine, and just as he's about to abscond with it, somebody blows a detonation charge, and the building starts to come down around him. The bottle's destroyed. I know, that's the saddest part of the whole story, you guys. Well, maybe not. Um, the bottle's destroyed. A piece of glass, like, lodges in his forehead, and uh, he, gets, he gets no free wine from the Nazis. But... The British press loved this story, and that's how he got the name Mad Jack. It was the press who were dying to get interviews with him and get pictures of his wound uh, that he even used, like, makeup to make it look worse than it really was as it was healing. <laughs> totally true. So that's how he became Mad Jack. And this isn't from that era. This is actually from the 1920s, but I love it because he's, you know, kilt complete, um, looking, looking very strapping. So you might have noticed... He was, he was in the military in the 1920s and then again in the war. The 1930s were a gap in his military service. And he wasn't kicked out, but he was get made to understand that he would not be advancing. And this is because of a thing called orders. And when one is a soldier, one receives a lot of orders. And Jack wasn't so hot about obeying the orders. I'll give you two examples. Number one he was ordered to stop playing his damn bagpipes at three in the morning outside the commanding officer's sleeping quarters. He declined to obey that order. Another order I think he got from his superiors was use the freaking gun we gave you, not your medieval longbow. Yeah. So another passion he picked up in the 1930s was archery. And he got so good at it, he went on to represent England in the 1939 World Archery Championships. And that's where this picture is from. Yeah, he was really good. And he got an opportunity to use those skills just a year later. So, yeah. <laughs> it's not funny if you're on the receiving end, but, uh, but we'll get there. Okay, so this is Dunkirk uh, in, in France. Um, as you probably know, it was the site of an absolutely desperate uh, evacuation trying to get British forces off of mainland Europe. Um, there was really literally no hope that the Germans would not take control, but they just wanted to stave them off. Every hour that they could buy meant hundreds of lives that might potentially be saved. So uh, Churchill was in charge of a small group of soldiers, and their job was just guerrilla warfare if you have to, but slow the Germans down however you can. So they found in the countryside outside of Dunkirk, they found a position where they could conceal themselves, and as a, a German regiment approached, um, he used his longbow to send a cloth yard shaft into the chest of the commanding officer of the Germans, <laughs> killing him. And this is, yeah, dead Nazi, thank you. This is the last known use of a longbow in like Western warfare, and of course the last known kill to this day, yeah. And in the ensuing confusion, right, a regular gunfight breaks out at that point, and he was nearly shot in the head. A bullet went right by his head, it caught his ear, nicked a chunk out of it, and he starts bleeding down the side of his face. But it isn't 48 hours later, with dried blood still on his face, he's tooling around Flanders, he somehow gets a motorcycle, this is not explained in any of the texts I read. He did have a motorcycle like this in, in India, um, so I used that picture. But anyway, he's tooling around, and he sees his friend, Rex King Clark, the guy we saw in the previous picture, who was also you know, a soldier in that fight. And, um, and does, he, does he go up and say, hey, you guys, do you have a medic? Or can I get some soap? This might be infected. No, he's odd salon people. He says, got anything to drink? <laughs> Right? Yeah, I know. Okay, now there are like eight other stories I wanted to fit in, but I can't. But I did sort of leave you hanging in 1944, so let's just bring that, bring that back around. So what about his capture on the island of Brach? This is a uh, photo from just a couple days after he was taken uh, as a prisoner of war. Um, he's wearing someone else's hat, someone else's jacket. He's sort of piecing together the clothes of the dead so he can have a proper uniform at this point. Um, but what I didn't tell you is that when he got to the top of the hill and saw that 
literally all was lost. He didn't duck for cover. He didn't look for any sort of escape route. He didn't try to get away. He got out his bagpipes. And he started playing a tune called Will Ye No Come Back Again. Basically saying, this is it, guys. And, uh, and lucky for him, they just knocked him out and took him into custody. But they did have orders to kill him. And nobody wanted to. And I think there are two reasons. <laughs> Number one is probably the obvious one. His last name was Churchill. And even though they were told, no, he's not related to Winston, which he wasn't, and no, he probably doesn't have great intel that we can use against the British, nobody wanted to be responsible for killing the guy named Churchill, only to find out later that some Nazi higher up is like, oh, we wanted to interrogate him. So they wouldn't kill him. The other reason, I think, is because he was so damn polite. This is the thank you letter he wrote to the man who was in charge of his captivity on the island of Brach. And it's hard, you can't read it on the screen. But basically it's like, thanks for the food, thanks for putting us up, blah, blah, blah. Hey, when this crazy war is over, come on over to my house. And he writes his goddamn street address <laughs> on the letter, come hang out, we're all soldiers. I mean, that's kind of a class act. So, keeping it to a short two-reeler here, they didn't kill him, they did send him up to Berlin where he was in a POW camp chained to a cement floor for about a month. They interrogate him, they figure he doesn't have an intelligence, they send him to a concentration camp. This was not to his liking and he left of his own volition. <laughs> they caught him shortly thereafter, they sent him down south to far northern Italy to another POW camp. Again, this time, well, I don't know, I was in Italy recently, the electrical system isn't great, and the power went out, and the perimeter was no longer lit one night, and he strolled out, and he walked 100 miles to Genoa when he finally found a, a column of American soldiers who were, who were come, moving north into France and managed to convince him. He, at this point, he was like emaciated and, and filthy and probably out of uniform, uh, but he managed to convince them that he was actually a British officer, and they took him in, and he managed to get back to England, but by the time he had regained his strength, the, the European war had pretty much come to an end. So what does he do? He starts heading to Japan before he has permission to head to Japan. But the Americans had this new thing that ended that war and that was pretty much the end of his, his combat career. Science, yeah, Jesus. Uh, off the rails. Okay, so here's a picture of Jack in... Uh, yeah, 1971, looking really freaking dapper. If I could look that good at that age, mm, all right. I'm gonna need a better wig. Um, but anyway, and he actually, this is 71, he lived until 1996, you guys. Yeah, you could not kill him. I don't know what killed him, but it wasn't another human, I can guarantee you that. But so reflecting on it, like, what, why, Jack? Why the theatrics? Why did you go into mechanized warfare with a bagpipe and a sword and a longbow? What's the freaking point? Well, in his obituary, uh, the Telegraph wrote the following. Churchill believed an assault leader should have a reputation which would at once demoralize the enemy and convince his own men that nothing was impossible. And if you meet the gaze of the guy in that picture and think about what he's done and I've given you just a small fraction I'm convinced at least for this guy nothing is impossible so uh, if you're out there somewhere in the afterlife Jack got anything to drink <laughs> <laughs>